Hello, my name is Setu Raman Panchanathan. I am the 15th director of the National Science Foundation. I am pleased to join you today to talk about the future of discovery and innovation. It is a bright future that is full of opportunities across the entire science and engineering enterprise and AAAS is going to play an important part in making it happen. Before I begin, I would like to thank AAAS President Claire Fraser and the annual program committee for the invitation to share my outlook for the research community and national competitiveness. I also want to commend the organizers and staff throughout AAAS who have worked to make this meeting happen virtually. 2020 was a year of enormous disruptions, but conferences like this are critical. They are how we make new professional connections and share ideas, and we come away with new energy and enthusiasm for our work. Thank you all for the hard work that went into making the 2021 annual meeting a great success. 72 years ago, President Harry Truman made a speech at the 1948 AAAS annual meeting in Washington, D.C. That meeting marked the 100th anniversary of the founding of AAAS. It was also a speech that helped strengthen the support for the creation of the National Science Foundation, which would happen two years later. In that speech, President Truman said, you are looking forward because we stand at the threshold of revolutionary developments. Scientific research daily becomes more important to our agriculture, our industry, and our health. The themes Truman spoke about would become the central elements of NSF's mission. The promotion of science, the advancement of national health, prosperity and welfare, and securing the national defense. What I am sharing with you today is resonant with President Truman's statement in 1948. We are on the threshold of revolutionary developments in science and engineering. And the scientific enterprise is critical to our national prosperity. When I say prosperity, I do not just mean economic prosperity. Investments in fundamental research is no doubt a major driver of economic progress and success. But I also mean the prosperity of ideas that comes when researchers thrive. More specifically, the societal prosperity that comes from people and communities having access to technology and applications that science and engineering are increasingly enabling. The vision I want to share with you today is how we take NSF's mission and advance it into the future. Our ability to support fundamental research over the long term and make strategic investments has brought us to a moment of tremendous potential. We are at a moment where decades of growth in our scientific knowledge and engineering capabilities have placed us in a position that we are going to be able to accomplish so much more going ahead. But there are three other factors that make this a defining moment for the research enterprise and make it even more compelling to strengthen the research enterprise at speed and at scale. First, we are in a period of intense global competition, perhaps the most competitive environment we have ever seen. How we meet this challenge will matter to our economy and our global leadership position. I want to underscore that competition is not a bad thing. Competition often brings out the best in all of us. It motivates us to do better, achieve more, and to do it faster. The second factor is the missing millions. These are millions of students and young people who are quite capable of succeeding in STEM careers, but are not making their way into the STEM community. We cannot make progress if we do not bring domestic talent out to its full force. We cannot, must not, and should not leave the amazing domestic talent behind. The third factor is the incredible bipartisan support that we are seeing for the science and engineering community. When I talk with senators and representatives and the staffers, they are excited about what the research community make possible 
for our nation. Congress and officials throughout the US government value the scientific spirit and they recognize the research community as a vital element of the fabric of our nation's prosperity, society, and economy. I am truly excited by the intensity and intentionality of the focus on science by the new administration. So in this unique moment, we are being challenged to succeed in an intensely competitive environment. We are being challenged to strengthen our community by mobilizing unrealized talent throughout the nation. And we are being challenged by our nation's leaders to accomplish more than we have ever before. How do we move forward then to meet this defining moment? I have been thinking for a long time about research, innovation, entrepreneurship, economic development, societal advancement, partnerships, and about how all of these areas are not separate, but are actually all part of a comprehensive environment that can support discovery and progress. And please allow me to say that I am delighted that Arizona State University is the host university for this year's conference. Many of the lines of thought that have grown into the vision I want to share with you today were influenced by my time at ASU and the wonderful support it provides to students and researchers from across the socioeconomic and geographic diversity of our nation. This vision has three major pillars. The first pillar is advancing research into the frontiers of the future. This is not new. We all know that. It has been the heart of NSF's mission for 70 years and will continue to be the core of what we do going forward. The second pillar is ensuring accessibility and inclusivity in STEM fields. This is an exceedingly important priority for me. As I said earlier, we cannot leave talent behind. There is so much untapped talent across the nation that can strengthen the science and engineering community. Every demographic and socioeconomic group and geographical area in the nation has diverse people who are capable of succeeding in STEM and contributing to the research enterprise. We need to scale up existing pathways into STEM fields for them and create new ways into science and engineering. And we need to do it quickly. We need to be unleashing all of the talent, bringing them to light, inspiring them, motivating them, and nurturing them. This is critical to making progress and being competitive. The third pillar is securing global leadership. By this, I do not mean that America is the leader and the rest are followers. Not at all. What I am talking about is that we are leading by our values. We are leading by our aspirations and in how we conduct ourselves in terms of openness, transparency, research integrity and reciprocity and more. We will work with any and all like-minded partners that share our values and share our commitment to advancing scientific progress. We will work with them to strengthen at speed and scale. The foundation for all of these pillars is partnerships. And here we are looking at partnerships very broadly. We are looking at not only how NSF can create partnerships, but also how we can foster environments where partnerships thrive because they are powerful ways to scale up research. All of this relies on a mindset of innovation. You can find the innovative spirit throughout the entire research community and it permeates NSF. And by sharing this mindset, we can inspire innovation across our nation. As I said before, Curiosity-driven, discovery-based, exploratory research is the bedrock of what NSF is and what it inspires and our mission to support the entire range of fundamental research. This is what is unique about NSF as an agency. All of the potential benefits of science, technology, and engineering that we see today are driven by the unbelievable power of discovery and curiosity-driven research. Think about all the different breakthroughs that have been enabled over the past 70 years. And now think about how many more new ideas and bigger ideas we are about to unleash through the power of curiosity-driven research. There are emerging opportunities and challenges where the research community's knowledge and expertise are critical to the national success and progress. COVID-19 is one such example. The race to understand and combat the coronavirus has been called the world's most important science project. That refers not only to the medical research funded by entities like the National Institute of Health, 
but to a wide range of challenges that come with the global pandemic. How can we use 3D printing to rapidly produce protective equipment and ventilators? How do we study the transmission of the virus through environmental systems like waterways? What social and behavioral challenges do people undergo in a pandemic? And how do we design better public health policies using that knowledge? These are just some of the questions that NSF has tackled through our rapid research programs and other funding mechanisms over the past year. Research centers are hubs for discovery and innovation. NSF-funded engineering research centers and science and technology research centers are exemplars in producing groundbreaking outcomes and new research opportunities. These research centers bring together ideas and talent across disciplines, institutions, and partners that result in strong curiosity-driven research and translational outcomes. Our investments in research centers help create lasting environments that foster new generations of students and researchers. For example, I see tremendous opportunities for artificial intelligence across our nation. AI is one of the most important industries of the future. It is already part of the people's daily lives, and it is only going to become more and more integrated into how we live and work. So, it is critical that we foster AI opportunities in every state of our nation. By this, I do not mean the same approach everywhere, but by leveraging the context in each state, it could be cutting edge research at universities and other research institutions. It could be K-12 learning opportunities and our community college training programs or industry partnerships and workforce training in AI. But the goal across all these different approaches will be the same. We are unleashing all the great talent across the nation. Quantum is another industry of the future that will need to be national in scope. How do we develop a national quantum platform that connects to every region of the country? There are places in the country with great talent, but quantum opportunities seem very far away. How do we bridge that gap? How can an eighth grader who is excited about science get to experience the mysteries of quantum revolution? Remember, while AI and quantum are important today, these frameworks should be such that any new focus area can become inclusive of ideas and talent from across the nation. As we look at different fields of science and engineering, an important question is how we come up with our new conceptualizations about how these fields can strengthen the nation. Resilience is one of those frameworks. How do we build greater resilience to pandemics or to natural hazards or to other disruptions? These are questions that bridge multiple disciplines but they are critical to our ability to be prepared for sudden or unexpected challenges. How do we incorporate resilience as a central ethos in our thinking, not just as an afterthought? For example, biotechnology and the bioeconomy are going to transform our health and well-being. How do we speed those industries and areas of research so that the incredible benefits they promise can be realized sooner? How do we expand learning and research opportunities in the biological sciences across the nation so that we can enhance the knowledge and capabilities that strengthen healthcare? The COVID pandemic has caused enormous upheaval for students around the world, which has shined a light on both the challenges and opportunities for learning everywhere. How do we scale knowledge platforms so that learners can grow and thrive no matter where they are? This is an enormous question for how we build technology and for how we design educational methodologies and for how we integrate social and behavioral knowledge at every level so that we can enhance and enrich outcomes. What this is showing us is that talent can be inspired anywhere and everywhere. And through everything we do, we think about how our work can enhance society. By expanding our knowledge of human behavior, economics, and social sciences, we can better understand how to design systems and policies that can have a meaningful impact on improving people's well-being, increasing the efficiency of systems we use every day, and strengthening our communities. By understanding the human element, we also make it possible to deploy science and technology more efficiently and more ethically 
so that the benefits of artificial intelligence or biotechnology or any other technology can be realized by everyone. Again, these cannot be afterthoughts, but integral to the thinking of how we advance science and technology advancements. These are just some examples of the landscape of curiosity driven research where NSF is already active. Some of them are elements of NSF that go all the way back to our founding. Others are new ways of strengthening how we advance fundamental science and engineering to support the research community. And there are thousands more activities where NSF is working to expand new research and foster the next generation of scientists and engineers. Now we are going to further turbocharge that work to reach new levels of productivity, growth and capacity. The three major turbocharge elements are people, partnership and translation. Over the past 70 years, we have worked to put ourselves on the launch pad that leads to a bigger and bolder future. People, partnerships and translation are the propellants that will boost us at speed and scale like tons and megatons of rocket fuel. People are at the heart of the research enterprise. And investments in people are one of the key ways that NSF strengthens the science and engineering community. One of my key priorities is realizing the full potential of the American workforce. There is tremendous science and engineering potential throughout our nation. But only a fraction of it becomes part of the broader STEM community. US competitiveness depends on reaching the talent because we need an agile and adaptable workforce that can upskill, reskill, and succeed through creative and innovative mindsets. To do that, we are looking at how we can scale up the reach of the broader STEM community so that anyone from any background and from any part of the country who has the talent or desire to go into STEM career is given the opportunity to do so. To do that, we are going to have to strengthen pathways into STEM fields and expand our reach into communities where talent exists. We are going to have to develop new approaches and tailor educational experiences to communities to be more effective at bringing talent into the STEM community. But I repeat, there is one area that is even more critical, the missing millions. In other words, making the invisible visible. The missing millions are the gap between the demographics of the research community and the demographics of the whole nation. This is a personal imperative for me because there is tremendous talent throughout the nation but the talent that exists in some demographics is not being brought into the STEM community. The full potential of our nation is not being utilized and that means that there are transformative insights and creative new ways of thinking and brilliant ideas that are being lost when people with the drive and capability to contribute to the STEM fields don't find their way to those opportunities. If we are going to build a research community and STEM workforce that capitalizes on the talent of this nation, it has to reflect the full talent that exists across the nation. That means we need to do at a minimum rapidly double the number of women in science and engineering. We need to more than double the number of African American scientists and engineers, triple the number of Hispanic and Latino SNE talent, and quadruple the number of American Indians, Alaskan and Hawaiian natives and Pacific Islanders scientists and engineers. Altogether, we need to create pathways into the STEM community for four million people. Indeed, a tall task, but I believe is definitely doable. It takes a village, partnerships of every type, every form to get this done and accelerate further. Broadening participation has been an agency-wide focus at NSF. In 2016, the agency made inclusivity one of its 10 big ideas for the future of investment when it launched the INCLUDES initiative a large-scale program of alliances that are building collaborative infrastructure to accelerate the spread and finding innovative solutions for inclusivity. What that means is that efforts that successfully increase participation by underrepresented groups do not remain one-time success stories confined to the classroom or the school or the community where they were originally implemented. Instead, 
they become starting points for other institutions and communities to learn from. NSF includes is building networks that are spreading best practices and proven approaches for bringing diverse talent into STEM fields. One of the NSF includes alliance programs I want to highlight is iGen, the inclusive graduate education network. This is a partnership of more than 30 scientific societies, institutions, organizations, corporations, and national laboratories that are committed to increasing the number of black, Latino, and indigenous students who receive bachelor and doctoral degrees. They are tackling key areas that end up being choke points for underrepresented groups. They are improving mentoring of young researchers to ensure that there is guidance and advice on how to advance their education and careers. They are making changes to graduate admissions processes to ensure fair consideration. They are focusing on recruitment to ensure that more students see the opportunities to undertake graduate studies. And they are working to improve graduate retention rates. The last component is especially important. We need to sustain students from underrepresented groups on their educational journeys. We know that women and black and Latino students leave STEM majors at a higher rate. And we know that they are also more likely to leave academic tracks rather than go on to pursue graduate degrees, postdocs, or early career research positions. One of the ways NSF does that is through the Louis Stokes Alliances for Minority Participation known as LSAMP. This program takes a comprehensive approach to developing and retaining STEM talent from underrepresented communities so that students can more successfully transition from community colleges to four-year universities and on to graduate programs. The resources, funding, and different initiatives NSF is deploying to support inclusivity and broaden participation are the seeds for building a STEM community that reflects the whole nation. The alliances and networks that we are building to connect programs and share resources and best practices are key to strengthening these efforts and extending their reach. But the final piece is the need to institutionalize these efforts and make them self-sustaining cultures of inclusivity that are embedded within communities. We need to strengthen at speed and scale. Because when we invest in supporting outcomes for one cohort of students, we want those benefits to also extend to the next set of students that come through and the ones after that and the ones after that long after NSF funding is no longer necessary. And so I want to take a moment to commend AAAS for its sea change program because it is a program that is supporting those institutional transformations that are important to sustain progress in broadening participation. This program is an example of how critical it is to look below the surface to understand deeper sources of inequality and to commit to cultural changes that ensure inclusive outcomes. Thank you for being part of the commitment to a STEM community that reflects the full potential of the nation. It is critical to building the community we need to achieve all of the unbelievable opportunities that are waiting for us. Partnerships are the second way NSF is turbocharging our advancements. And we are looking at how we take partnerships to a new level that matches the incredible goals we have for discovery and innovation. Partnerships can accelerate discovery and innovation by expanding the landscape of questions we can investigate or by giving us new tools for expanding our understanding of different topics. Think about massive data sets from the technology industry or the variety of information that the engineering and manufacturing sector has. And when we connect fundamental research with a government agency or a business entity, it creates new ways of thinking about problems and generates novel approaches to solving them. But as I said at the beginning, fundamental research is NSF's core mission. And so fundamental research will also be the core mission of our approach to partnerships. We are undertaking partnerships that add value to the research enterprise. Partnerships of different types and forms within NSF, interagency partnerships, industry partnerships, partnerships with foundations and philanthropy, partnerships with K-12 community college and universities, partnership with states and municipalities, international partnerships, and more. We want to accomplish two things with partnerships. First, we want to create platforms and initiatives that can foster extraordinary or profound research undertakings. 
Think of the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR, which includes half a dozen federal agencies and has been making breakthroughs in weather and climate research for six decades. Or think of the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory at the South Pole or Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array in Chile, which are both international undertakings that are helping reveal the structure of the universe to us. These are often direct partnerships in which NSF is a sponsor and contributes directly to logistics and management. They can be with nonprofits like the partnership between NSF and the Simons Foundation to enable innovative research on the mathematics of complex biological systems. And of course, industry partnerships like the partnership with Boeing to support inclusivity across STEM fields and to upskill critical sectors of the advanced manufacturing workforce. The second thing we want to accomplish is to create environments where partnership between researchers and industry and communities and every kind of stakeholder can grow and thrive. These are indirect partnerships that NSF programs and resources help catalyze. Think of how science and technology centers and engineering research centers bring scientists and engineers together with industry partners. Or how the Smart and Connected Communities program links up cutting edge researchers with municipal governments to solve problems like public health, economic growth and high tech infrastructure. By taking this dual track approach of direct and indirect partnerships, we are able to explore questions and challenges that might never have been considered by researchers or external stakeholders working separately. As NSF has expanded our work on partnerships in recent years, we have learned more about what makes them work. We know that personal relationships matter, but it can take a very long time for personal relationships to build the trust and cooperation necessary to launch a partnership. We know that partnerships need champions on both sides who can spur progress, guide their respective organizations, and help navigate challenges that can arise over the long timelines it takes to get a new partnership off the ground. And we know that partnerships must be grounded in strategies that have a clear view of the goals, responsibilities, and outcomes that stakeholders are working toward. As we look at how to strengthen the research enterprise at speed and scale, you may be looking at what we know about partnerships and say, Punch, how are you going to deploy partnerships at scale when each partnership requires so much individual attention? My answer is, we are learning exponentially more about partnerships with each one that we undertake. And we are applying what we learned so that each new partnership can be built more efficiently. That is a process that is allowing us to accelerate and expand how we implement new partnerships. So, as we go forward, we are going to see more and more partnerships that support unbelievable research projects and build highly productive research environments. And at the same time, each of those experiences will be part of how we strengthen partnerships at speed and scale. And finally, Translation is the connection between curiosity-driven, discovery-based, exploratory research and use-inspired, solutions-focused, translational research. Science and technology are intertwined. NSF advances technological progress because it is already intrinsic to everything we do. The scientific pursuit of knowledge and understanding cannot be separated from the development of new technological capabilities. And in turn, those new capabilities allow us to pursue new research questions that were out of our reach. It is the double helix of exploratory research in synergy with translational research. This is the DNA of NSF. It is how we are going to make transformational leaps forward in discovery and innovation. And it is made possible by the elements of NSF that I have already talked about. Strategic long-term commitments to funding the entire spectrum of basic research, supporting and strengthening the people who make up the research community and whose dedication and brilliance make progress possible, and partnerships that catalyze innovation ecosystems and empower the co-design and co-creation of new ideas, new technology, and new frontiers of discovery. And because this is the DNA of NSF, it also becomes part of the genome of the thousands upon thousands of projects that NSF supports.
It's part of the creative spirit that drives researchers and engineers to reach farther than before. It is part of the growth of technology as it makes its way out of the laboratory and into people's hands. Let me share with you an example of how this synergy works. In the 1980s, NSF had established supercomputer centers and was trying to find a way to make those resources available to more researchers. So the agency began to link research universities and other institutions to the supercomputer centers and this became NSFnet in 1985, 35 years ago. This was a leap forward. It was the first large-scale implementation of internet technology. It was a project that was driven by NSF, but at the same time, it was a complex environment of independently operated networks. It was an important tool for researchers, but it was also a research project in itself. As NSFnet continued to grow, there were practical problems to work out. But there were also thousands of important research questions to explore across computer science, electrical engineering, and other fields that needed to be answered in order to make today's internet possible. NSFnet was decommissioned in 1995 so that the World Wide Web could continue to grow as a public platform for commerce and communication. But even then, when the research project known as NSFnet was displaced by the emergence of the internet, countless research questions were still being continually generated across multiple areas of discovery and innovation. And the cycle continues today as we continue to make progress in understanding how to push the capabilities and horizons and power of computing systems even further. LIGO is another example. This is a project that was decades in the making at NSF. And early on, there were questions about whether detecting gravitational waves was possible. Not as a matter of theory, but as a practical matter of whether it would ever be possible to develop the technology necessary to make those detections. In 1979, NSF made a grant to Kip Thorne for a new approach to quantum measurement to help bridge the technological gap and bring gravitational wave detection into the realm of the possible. An unbelievable feat that would happen 36 years later. Our pursuit of discovery science, in this case, gravitational waves, was part of a cycle that included innovative technical solutions for quantum sensing. And that cycle has continued repeating itself over and over until today. We are relying on the culmination of decades of research to peer even deeper into the cosmos, to understand the fabric of the universe. And at the same time, we are building on the knowledge we have gained to develop a new generation of quantum sensors that will be critical to technological applications, ranging from cutting edge research to commercial products. There are many, many more examples of how NSF supports translation. Think of Google's founders who were NSF grant recipients before their search engine rose to the top of the internet. Or think of Qualcomm, which is now a massive multinational corporation. In the 1980s, Qualcomm was supported by NSF's SBIR program to develop a new type of chip for wireless communications. That is technology that lives in your pocket as part of the cell phones we all carry every day. And that's not the only piece of your smartphone that has NSF's DNA. When you check your weather app, you're looking at information that was enhanced by NSF-funded research to improve the capabilities of the National Radar Network. The lithium-ion batteries were the result of NSF-funded research that went on to win the Nobel Prize in 2019. The touchscreen interface was developed by an NSF-funded graduate student and his professor at the University of Delaware. The GPS technology for navigation and other functions is part of a long history of NSF funding for research in geographic information systems. I reiterate, exploration and translation is NSF's DNA. And we leave that imprint on the genome of everything we touch. That is how we encourage creativity and strengthen discovery well beyond the reach of our direct funding. It is how we align our goals with the challenges and needs facing the world around us and unleash the enormous power of the research enterprise. AAAS is one of the leading partners in the science and engineering enterprise. I have talked about the long history of fundamental research that has brought us to this point today where so much is possible. AAAS 
has been there at every step since 1848 to contribute to the foundations of our knowledge and foster the community of discoverers and innovators. And as we look ahead to building on that foundation and achieving even more, I am thrilled that AAAS will be part of that work. Thank you again for this opportunity to join you and I look forward to seeing the wonderful things that AAAS and its members will accomplish in the coming years. Thank you.